it is a pleasure uh, to welcome you to the next edition of the Nano Explorations. Uh, just as a quick reminder, uh, we are going to take questions at the very end. Uh, at the very end, you'll be able to either raise your hand or indeed send us a note via chat, uh, and we'll gladly entertain your questions. Our speaker today is uh, Misha uh, Shalaginov. Uh, Misha is a member of JJ Who's Lab uh, over in uh, Material Science Department. Uh, his uh, training as electrical engineer, applied physicist, indeed, has positioned him in a unique position to blend the expertise in materials with the blend of uh, apply applications of those materials. And so uh, today uh, we'll have a fantastic talk, I'm, I'm sure, <laughs> uh, of reconfigurable meta optics with uh, chalcogenite alloys. So, Misha, please uh, take over and uh, tell us the story. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Vladimir, for the introduction. Pleasure. So, I hope everybody can hear me well, right, and see the screen. Uh, so, this is uh, the work which I would like to present today. It has been done within a, a quite a big collaboration between. MIT, UMass Lowell, Lincoln Labs, uh, University of Central Florida, and Lockheed Martin. Uh, and this is our team in the DARPA Extreme Optics project. And today I would like to talk about the meta optics part of it. So, a big mission in uh, meta optics is to go beyond the traditional uh, optical components. And this example is a lens, which are uh, currently uh, quite bulky. There is definitely space to decrease the size of, of this. And also the, the holy grail of optics is how to make the optical components tunable and active. So which, uh, which makes this, uh, opens the new avenues for the dynamic de optical devices. And we use the approach of um, reconfigurable metal lens. And here you can see an example which can bring us to ultra thin and tunable devices. In the, today's talk, I would like to uh, break it into three parts. So the first one will be the introductory part in general about meta surfaces. How do they work? What are the key advantages of them? And what are the main challenges in the field? After that, I would like to introduce the material platform, uh, which is based on calcogenite glasses or alloys. In this case, this is a newly uh, developed material of um, germanium, antimonide, selenium, telluride, and see how it can be applied for active nanophotonics. And the third part is how to use, to leverage that material platform for demonstrating uh, dynamic or reconfigurable device. In this case, it's a very focal, non-mechanically actuated metal lens. So on that, I would like to move with the first part and introduce the metasurface optics. So traditionally, uh, the, the, if we consider a lens, uh, the incident wave transforms into the spherical wave and then converges into a point. So if we go deeper into the mechanism, how it happens, we would see that each of the rays uh, acquires a certain phase so it's related to the optical path in the material. You could see the, uh, the central array here uh, acquires a larger phase and on the side, a smaller phase. So as a result, you can have distribution of this phase delay, uh, which is imprinted on the incident um, phase profile of the electromagnetic wave. So let's think how can we use nanotechnologies to further advance the optical elements. One of the ways is to introduce a nano-optical scatterers, which can uh, add a certain phase delay uh, to the incident wave. And by uh, having these nanoscatterers on the surface, you can, in principle, engineer uh, what is the introduced uh, phase shift of the, on, on the incident wave. And as a result, by having these sub-wavelength features, it's possible to reconstruct, it's possible to reconstruct uh, this, um, or mimic the phase delay, which can be done by conventional lenses. Uh, the key advantage here is that uh, this 
systems, as you can see, they have, they're small in size, they're more compact, uh, small weights. So as a result, you can improve what is called the swap C characteristics. And additionally, this platforms opens new functionalities because now you have more degrees of freedom to control uh, the wavefront of, or in general, the properties of the, of the light. Just to give you a taste of how these structures are implemented and look like, here is an overview of several works by uh, groups which work in the direction. I would like to specifically point out in the direction of all the electric matter surfaces because uh, mostly they, they can provide lower losses and uh, bring us to higher efficiency devices. So this field started about five years ago five or six years ago. Um, uh, this is how, when they started to call this all the electric matter surfaces. Although one of the first work appeared back in 1998 by Lalanne's group in the Institute of Optics in France. And as you can see, if you pay attention to the structures, they're periodic structures, and then uh, you can vary. They, ver they have quite simple shapes. In this case, it's either rectangular pillars ellipsoidal pillars, circular pillars, rectangular ones with different um, um, sizes. Or for example, you can change the angle. And this way uh, you, can, the, you can introduce that uh, phase delay on that particular pitch of the, uh, of the surface. And as a result, there have been shown several capabilities. You can, for example, here, you can do the vortex beam, you can do lensing, you can combine uh, several functionalities on a single metal lens. However, let's, if we, if we look at uh, material aspects of these devices, you can see that most of them are made of silicon or, for example, in the visible range of titanium dioxide. So let's explore deeper the space of the materials. So here I would like to show you the, the map. Uh, on the x-axis we have the wavelength range which spans from the visible up to infrared, uh, covering near AR and mid infrared. And on the y-axis it's like the figure of merit for the materials which stands for like Q factor, uh, quality or like uh, losses in, in inversely proportional to the losses. And if we look at the visible and infrared, you can see that there is a lot of materials available. And uh, that's why they just demonstrated to you the examples of titanium oxide or silicon based systems. Although in the mean infrared range, there is kind of a gap. So there is definitely need for new materials uh, which can be used for building the meta surfaces. Particularly, uh, here are the key metrics for the required material. So we need high index because we would like to confine the light in the subwinding structures. So it's desirable to have index of, for example, three, four, five, or as high as possible, low losses. So this gives us a high efficiency. Um, and in addition to that, can we go even further and think about of the materials which are reconfigurable and also perhaps could be friendly to uh, be integrated with uh, other material platforms. And here comes the material platform which has been recently developed in our group. Uh, this is a cocagenite alloy, namely germanium, antimonite, uh, selenium, telluride. Uh, and before I go to the properties of our material, I would like to point out that the main challenges in the field of active uh, meta surfaces, this is uh, nowadays the major direction uh, in, the, in, uh, in, the, in the field of meta surfaces. And you can see people have demonstrated uh, a lot of different methods, how the properties of the meta surfaces can be controlled. So this is mechanical, electro-optical uh, phase transitions. So we belong to the category of the phase transition materials, thermal opticals, all optical effects. And overall, the, 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 main, um, the, the, the main challenges in the field is nowadays, or like the drawbacks of the, of the existing systems is that they either have a very limited or minuscule tuning range or 
they have problems with the efficiency. So uh, as our goal, we would like to move towards the, to, to improve the systems and bring them to the next level in terms of having a decent uh, tuning range of the optical properties, as well as improving efficiency and in general, the performance. And uh, here we, I would like to go into more details about the material. Uh, this graph demonstrates the optical properties, uh, namely the refractive index and the extinction coefficient. Uh, and this is a dependence on the wavelength. Here we plot it from, uh, from like uh, one micron uh, to nine micron. And you can see that uh, this uh, material, it has pretty high refractive index on the around four uh, and quite, uh, quite low uh, losses, uh, which is especially in the mid infrared range. In both amorphous and crystalline state, they can go uh, down to almost 0 0.01, uh, in the order of 0 0.01, 0.1. And in addition to oh, the low losses and high refractive index, we'll also have the capability of this material to transition between the two states. For example, you can go from amorphous state to crystalline state, and as a result, there is a high contrast in the refractive index uh, about delta n about 1.5 or up to two. Uh, so the question is, the next question would be, how can this material be switched from amorphous to crystalline state? And we have explored two methods, how it can be done. It can be achieved by optical uh, switching. So we, we just heat the material with the laser pulses or electrical heaters. So this is the integrated uh, thermal systems uh, where the material is positioned on the bridge. Uh, as a result, we send the current and due to ohmic losses, the um, Omic heating, the material heats up and can transition from amorphous to crystalline state. It can be done reversibly. In one direction, it's from amorphous. So when we deposit it, the material is in amorphous state. And if we heat it up or anneal, uh, for example, with the small amplitude, long, long pulses, uh, the material can go from amorphous to crystalline state. And a reverse, a reverse process is the annealing, is the annealing with the short pulses. Uh, here, is an here is an example of uh, uh, how we demonstrated, how, how, we de how we demonstrated a pixel uh, with the size of about one micron as well as 30 micron of this uh, GSST material. This is a thin film of about 50 nanometers. And it, we have shown that it can be electrically switched with the tungsten heater. And here is the demonstration we have recorded. Uh, and I would like to show you how, how it works. So you can see that it changes reflection from about 25% uh, to, to 35%. And it works reversibly. Um, so if we would like to discuss what, are, what is the time range of these transitions, so it can go for amorphization, uh, the, the time constant is about one microsecond and for crystallization is about uh, tens of uh, milliseconds. And we have shown that the switching can be done uh, on the cycle range of about a thousand times. And potentially, so since this uh, material is close to the uh, so-called uh, germanium antimonide telluride family. Uh, for, for that, th this is an established uh, material platform which has been shown up to, I believe, several millions of cycles or even more. So in principle, we just need to test it uh, further if we'd like to, to show how, how robust is, is this platform. Uh, I also would like to mention that uh, so here are the two states, amorphous and crystalline, but by varying the pulse, the electrical pulse conditions, we can also achieve the intermediate states. Uh, and here you can see the, the experimental results of the reflectance 
changes when the voltage, for example, was swept uh, between the 9.5 volts to 11.3. And you can see different spectral responses of the GSST material between 1200 nanometers up to 1700 nanometers. And now I would like to switch towards um, uh, the demonstration of the optical devices, which can be achieved on our material platform. Um, I don't know, maybe there is a one quick question somebody would like to, to ask uh, about what I have just presented. Or we can leave it to the end. All right. So about the, uh, so we have shown you the material platform and now how can we use it to, to build the non-mechanically non actuated metal lines? So here you can see the illustration, how it would work like in 3D. Uh, it basically uh, changes the focal spot between the two positions. Here I have a 2D graph of it, maybe better to explain it schematically here. So we designed metal lens, which in, when it's in amorphous state, uh, the, the intensity goes to the focal spot with the distance 1.5 millimeters. And when we switch the material and the matter atoms or the matter surface reconfigures in a way that now the focal spot goes to two millimeters instead of 1.5 millimeters. So this is the main functionality of uh, the device. And how it can be done, uh, so we can start from the basics of the metal lens. So let's have a look at the phase profile. So by uh, analytical, uh, analytically it can be shown that uh, the, the function or the, the, phase, the phase map, the phase dependence on X and Y coordinates, which describes the length, the lensing functionality can be, is, uh, uh, is expressed by this formula where D is the distance between the point on the, on the plane and uh, the focal spot location. And F is the focal length. So D is basically the square root of um, uh, X, X square plus Y square minus, minus F square. And so if we construct this ideal lens in the case of the, uh, in, in the case, if we have a like rectangular aperture, this is how it will look like. So here you can see the continuous variation of the phase from, from zero to 360 is shown with a color. Uh, however, when we deal with the actual meta surfaces, we need to do the discretization. And here I would like to do the, the most like the, the step of uh, what they call like one bit discretization. So now instead of all these continuous colors from blue to yellow, we'll, we'll just uh, convert it into black and white colors. So basically if the, the color is between zero and 180 degrees uh, phase, we will assign it uh, to, to uh, we assign it to black and if it's above then to white. And here you can see um, how it will look like this, this distribution. Now let's proceed. How can we achieve the dynamic tunability of this metal end? So what we need to do, we need to switch between the two phase profile. So it, in, in, you can understand it as uh, we have a, you can, you can think about it as a phase filter. So in a morpho state, it has a pattern like shown on the left side. And then when we switch it to crystalline or the second state, we would like when we change the focus spot, the, fo uh, the phase profile or the phase map changes, it has a different shape. So in this one bit discretization, black and white approach, what needs to be done, we need to uh, since we have a periodic system here and each of these colors is like a pixel, we need to do a pixel by pixel switching. 
Uh, and since we have two types of pixel, black and white, we need four transitions, black to black, black to white, white to black, white to white. And how it can be achieved is that uh, we need to find the geometries of these meta atoms or scatterers, which will perform these transitions. So for example, when, uh, if we take the geometry number one in amorphous state, and then switch to crystalline state, its phase profile should be close to zero. Or if we take the other one, it should, for example, switch from zero delay, phase delay to 180 phase delay. And these phase delays we can calculate with, a, uh, for example, full wave like numerical simulations um, to find out what is the response. And it, it's actually quite a complicated numerical problem because you need to uh, explore quite a number of the geometries in order to find uh, the, uh, the this, this, this certain phases, phase values uh, for like particular refractive indices. And at the same time, you would like to take into account also the amplitude response. So we would like to transmit most of the light. And indeed, if we analyze this one bit approach, I would like to show that how this discretization degree, it actually influences a lot the optical efficiency of the optical device. So if our um, discretization degree is, is the smallest, which is one bit, just two colors or two phase values, the optical uh, efficiency ideally can be up to 40%. Well, by adding additional phase values or increasing the discretization degree, for example, lifting it to two bits, I have in four colors now, we can increase the efficiency about twice. We can keep going the same path and introduce more and more phase values, if you wish, more, more phase colors. We can keep going this path and increasing the efficiency. However, there is a trade-off which I would like to point out, like the more uh, phase values you add here for the device, the more difficult it's to come up with the geometries. Because here, for one bit, we just need four meta atoms. If we would like to have two bits or four phase values, uh, we need 64 different meta atoms. And we, if we go up to three bit, it's, it's uh, even more, so it keeps increasing. And additionally, what we also noticed is that uh, by fabrication, we introduce some deviations to the shape of the meta atoms and the more uh, discretization you have, the more you need precision between the numerical design and the um, fabricated uh, samples. So here we have um, we, we have stopped on the 2B discretization and uh, now would like to show how we have designed and implemented uh, this type of structure. So we started from, as I mentioned earlier, with the ideal uh, phase maps, which you can see here, which correspond to two focal spots, one at 1.5 millimeters, the second one is at two millimeters. So these are the continuous phase profiles. After that, we go through the step of discretization. So now instead of continuous colors, we introduce four colors or four phase values, uh, which roughly corresponds to zero, pi over two, pi and uh, three pi over two. And after that, we find the geometries of the meta atoms. Of course, they're not ideal in terms of phase. Uh, there are some deviations. And you can see that by applying these meta atoms and putting them on the map, we get more like uh, uh, the, the, phase, the phase, numerically calculated phase maps profiles, which, is, which are the closest to our experimental demonstrations. And here are the meta-atom shapes, which we used to build uh, the meta-surface. So here you can see that, as I said, there are like, should be 16 of them. Uh, these are the transitions between, I think it's easier to understand uh, in terms of colors. So we need four groups of meta-atoms and show that uh, we have transitions from red to all the other colors, from yellow to all the colors, from green and blue. 
of course, there is some deviations uh, for these particular geometries. And here we could see what is the difference between the ideal phase maps in both amorphous and crystalline state uh, and the actual, like the final layout metasurfaces which we're going to fabricate. And uh, yeah, so basically in this case, we have uh, what is called four level metasurface. Um, yeah, with the, with the 16 meta atoms in, in principle, you can design it with a high degrees of discretization if you would like. Now I would like to uh, introduce the, um, uh, how this meta surface was fabricated. So we uh, leveraged the platform of germanium antimolite selen uh, selenium telluride, which was evaporated using this thermal co-evaporation technique on calcium fluoride. Here we needed the thickness of the film about one micron. And in order to control the stoichiometry, uh, we had two targets. One is germanium antimonide telluride, and the second one is germanium antimonide selenide. We have two uh, quartz crystal monitors, and by evaporating, we can adjust the rates from these targets, and as a result, have the desired stoichiometry between selenium and tellurium as 4 to 1. After that, uh, there is a step of uh, electron beam lithography followed by the etching procedure with um, fluorine gases. So here you could see uh, on the SEM image how the structures look like. So this is, I would say, quite straightforward uh, single layer fabrication. Uh, this, is, this is one of the actual advantages of the meta surfaces uh, since these structures are quite easy to fabricate comparing to multi-layer systems. And after that, we have we proceeded to characterizing of the meta surfaces. So in this particular case, uh, what do we study? We look at the focusing efficiency, which is the power which goes to the focus port uh, to the power incident on the meta surface. Of course, there is some Fresnel reflection. So, but we are looking at the power uh, which reaches the meta surface here. Then the second characteristic which we studied is the uh, point spread function. So in this case, we would like to confirm that our focal spot is diffraction limited. So this is uh, justified by measuring the Strader ratio. So Strader ratio is basically the peak, the ratio of peak powers of um, uh, the fabricated met and characterized metal lens to the one of the uh, ideal, ideal lens. And the third part is when we switch the metal lens between the two states, we'd like to find out what is the contrast ratio because we anticipate that uh, we have two focal spots and uh, in, uh, some of the power may go to the second focal spot. So that's what we'd like to compare. How, what is the ratio between the uh, power going to the primary focal spot and then to the secondary focal spot? So after this, uh, performing the characterization, uh, uh, here uh, demonstrated the, 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 the main results of our studies. So on the left side is the meta surface when it was, meta lens when it was in amorphous state. On the right side is when it was in crystallized state, shown in red. So what we can see that as expected, as well as designed, most of the power in amorphous state goes to focal Point F1 at 1.5 millimeters. And there is some, some power goes and goes to focus spot F2. And if we take the ratio of the, uh, of the power, so which is like the integrated, this is, there should be intensity. So this is like the uh, integrated intensities, uh, which, will, which will show that the contrast ratio is about uh, 10 to one. Um, yeah, is 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 about is about ten to one, and if we, so here you can see like the two D uh, distributions of the intensities, and if we look at the uh, uh, crystalline state, we have observed that uh, 
and the contrast ratio even improved here. So it, it went to 90 to one. So now most of the power goes to focus plot F2. Uh, yeah, here it's actually, it's not contrast ratio, it should be stray ratio. So in both cases, uh, the stray ratio is above 0.9 and which uh, confirms or verifies that the metal lens produces uh, a diffraction limited focal spot. So which gives basically the ultimate uh, resolution for the optical element. Also, I would like to point out here that for our system, we have measured the efficiencies of about 24 and 22%. This is quite important because uh, in this case we have um, we were really happy to see that in both states, uh, we have uh, decent efficiencies because most of the, uh, one of the problems in uh, existing uh, phase change material matter surfaces is that usually the efficiency is more or less good for one state, but quite low for the another one, typically for the crystalline state. And also, um, in this case, we were able, comparing to other people, to achieve the, um, uh, the diffraction limited performance, which uh, haven't been shown so far for non-mechanically actuated uh, reconfigurable metal lenses. Uh, after that, we also uh, considering, considered to, to show some demonstrations, uh, what can we do with this metal lens? For example, we can produce images from the double-sided targets. In this case, these are the USAF uh, resolution chart targets, which uh, you can see like arrays on them here. Uh, each of these squares represents three stripes, three vertical and three horizontal stripes. And as you can see in our uh, setup, we have exposed the target with the laser light. Laser light has to be diffused and we also use the uh, the lens to scatter the light, diffuser and scatter, and the lens to scatter the light as much as possible to avoid the speckles in the image. Uh, and we have studied the imaging capability of the metal lens, both on just a single resolution chart and as well as showing that we can uh, obtain the images of on the two sides of this target by just changing the uh, material properties. So by, by switching from amorphous to crystalline state. And here you can see the photographic, the photograph of, of the setup. Uh, here on this side, there are like two targets. Uh, and the distance between them is exactly the, the difference between the two focal spots. And after comes the metal lens, which collects it. Um, collects the image, sorry, uh, yeah, collects the, the, the signal and then sends it towards the compound lens of our IR camera. Uh, so in here, we, I would like to show you the experimental results which, which we have obtained. Uh, so for a single target for amorphous state, as expected, uh, we would like to, it, it has been shown that uh, the image is formed in the uh, focal plane of one Almost nothing is observed at focal plane of two and similar effect is shown for the crystalline state. Uh, of course, there is like some kind of what we call a ghost image or some noise. Uh, contribution from the secondary, um, uh, secondary focus spot. And here's an example of imaging on the double layer, double layer target. So we could, for example, uh, these two targets, they were overlapped at the angle of 45 degrees. When it's a morpho state, you can get the image of the straight pattern. And when we switch to crystalline state, we could see the other pattern, which is rotated by 45 degrees. And uh, so these images, they actually, uh, they are close to the diffraction limit uh, of the optical system. I, yeah, you can see it's, on the order of like 20, 20 microns, and that it's also crossed up free, so we don't really see uh, the images from other planes. On that, I would like to summarize the talk. So I hope uh, uh, you have learned today um, about the meta surfaces, about the major challenges in the field. Uh, 
in particular the all the electric reconfigurable metal lenses and what we explore in our group uh, new material platforms which can uh, help us in addressing these problems in this particular case we have developed a non-volatile uh, phase change material with the broadband transparency uh, the GSST and the second one the second and the third one is developing the design principles uh, as well as uh, the implementation of uh, meta optical devices in this case i have shown you the very focal metal lens uh, which can switch between the two focal spots and we show that it it can produce uh, diffraction limited uh, focusing as well as imaging and it's non-mechanically tuned and as well it is, has decent um, uh, so it has decent tuning range as well as quite good efficiency. So on that, I would like to conclude my talk. Uh, I also have some ad additional slides if, because we also explore the direction of uh, new designs which are based on uh, machine learning because I, I have mentioned previously that there is a there is a challenge of finding these uh, geometries. Uh, so this is related to the inverse design problems of the meta surfaces and optimizing the efficiencies. But overall, um, I think I would stop here and would be glad to uh, get some questions. And also, I would like to thank the organizers, uh, especially of, of Vladimir and Cherise, for running this initiative. I think it's it's great for. Uh, MIT nano community to have this event and um, bring the members together, share uh, share our knowledge. On that, yeah, thank you. Hello. I don't think I can hear anybody. Hello. Uh, my apologies. We had a technical no difficulty for a moment. Uh -huh. uh, uh, well, uh, this uh, we have a few minutes uh, before we'll conclude, and uh, it would be a delight to uh, entertain some questions. Uh, if you have a question, uh, there are two ways you can raise it. One of them is you can uh, indeed provide us a question through the chat feature down on the bottom of your Zoom screen. The other option is, uh, if you wish, uh, you can raise hand. By raising hand, uh, you can go to the participants tab down on the bottom, uh, and a new window will open uh, at the bottom of that screen. There's a raise hand feature. In either case, we would love to hear from you if you have any questions. Uh, Yelena has a question. Um, so let me see if I can quickly unmute you. Yeah. Yes, you're unmuted. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Yelena. Thanks for the talk. Um, I have a question just more so on the elements themselves. Is there any way that we re reconfigure to more than two states? So have three states or four states for a single mm -hmm. uh, Is Is it about the existing state of the art or you're asking about the possibility where it can be achieved? Um, I, I guess for the existing state, you have just uh, these, these this binary uh, mm -hmm. modality, but perhaps could you think of other ways that maybe you could get three states or four states? Uh, yeah, that's, um, I, I would say that's probably like one of the, one of the biggest goals in the community, um, how to achieve the to, to, to increase the density of the, of the states, not just have two as in our case. Uh, so maybe like about our particular platform, I have shown previously, um, I've shown earlier that it is possible to have an intermediate states. Mm 
So yes, we can have intermediate states. Uh, I think here the main challenge is to uh, how to find the geometries. Uh, well, you can, or alternatively, so you can either uh, switch like the whole meta surface into several states, but then you need to, when you switch all of them at the same time, you need to uh, precisely engineer or find out the geometries of the meta atoms. So I think in that case, uh, the development of optimization approaches or um, deep neural network could help to find the geometries. Or alternatively, what could be done is that you can independently uh, control each of the meta atoms in the way that you can, like for example, you have a patch and then you, if, you, if you have access to control uh, the phase of each of the meta atom, you can in principle introduce um, arbitrary number of, uh, of the phase maps. Uh, as I know, the, the, this works, the, there were a couple of works where uh, people try to go into this, uh, uh, what is called like the ultimate meta surface where you can control um, like one meta atom, like each of the meta atoms or groups of the meta atoms, but it's, it's, it's just like, um, um, yeah, I don't think there, there has been shown a good multi-state meta surface with high efficiency. Okay, so I'm, I'm looking at the time and I'm gonna ask just mm -hmm. a couple more quick questions uh, from uh, uh, Navid Devar. Uh, what are the future uses for this uh, from uh, your point of view? Where would you the find this as a technology? Hmm, okay. So in short, I think that uh, this could be used in the applications where uh, we have strict limits on the size weight. Uh, this could be the space or um, I mean, the immediate applications like in space technologies, in like uh, some drones, uh, flying objects, or um, as a like field deployable devices. Mm -hmm. um, the materials processing itself, uh, the question would be how reproducible would the materials processing be? Uh, as you change, for example, from amorphous to a crystalline material, uh, do you find the same index of refraction all the time or is there a variation? Um, consequently, how robust is this as a technology that might be found in a military equipment or otherwise? Mm -hmm. Yeah, materials is uh, always tricky to work with, uh, but I think we have more or less achieved like it's a repeatable procedure. So as soon as you strictly follow all the steps, um, and uh, minimize the deviations, I, I, it, it, it works pr pretty well. So we can, uh, yeah, we can, we can reproduce these uh, devices or the material properties. Um, I'm gonna paraphrase uh, Douglas Fishkind's question uh, where he asked about what kind of operations you might find uh, around the edges. Um, meaning, you know, as you look at the definition of how sharp the edge can be or how small the feature of your amorphous versus crystalline material would be. What's the sharpest that people have at this point shown? Is it simply limited by the diffraction limit or can you go better than that? Mm. Yeah, so, so far uh, for uh, it's the ultimate goal, yeah, it's like diffraction limited performance uh, that was is given like by laws of physics. However, uh, th there are some approaches uh, which was shown earlier, like for example, hyperlands, uh, where you can try to beat the diffraction limit. Uh, but so far, as I understand, the efficiencies they are quite low. So it's it's so far like a trade-off. I have a, one more written question, and then I'll turn to Carlos. Uh, written question in the chat by Stephen uh, Stephen Stephen Philip uh, Philippone. Sorry about that. Um, so, uh, comments on the fact that you mentioned a thousand cycles uh, as the number of cycles that you have had a chance to test uh, the, rep the repeatability between crystalline amorphous phases. Is there a limit to that? Uh, do you find the deformation of the 3D structure with repeated cycling, for example? Hmm. Yeah, well, uh, I don't think we have like some, um, well, it's what, what we're still trying to explore, uh, like what, what, how can we improve? I, I have seen there was like uh, recently 
for example, work by having a, a multi-layer super lattices to improve the uh, robustness of the switching. Um, yeah, I mean, still, yeah, it's it maybe would be good to to discuss that. Uh, we are we're happy to find the solutions for like um, to to increase the stability of of the material and improve these features. Well, as, as any early work, uh, there are plenty of unanswered questions, but certainly a tremendous amount of promise in what you had a chance to show. Um, the, the last question I'm going to direct to Carlos, uh, who raised his hand. Carlos, please go ahead. Yeah. It's a quick question about the numbers, the efficiency that you were showing uh, of 24%. What's limiting that? Is it uh, absorption or scattering or? Uh, yeah, there is like several features. Uh, what what limits our efficiency? One of them is the discretization of the phase, uh, losses of the uh, inside the material, um, and yeah. So mostly, I think it's it's a scattering scattering out. So it's it um, um, it scatters back or in the other directions. So I think that's that's the way uh, we are, we're trying to improve. All right. Uh, on that point, uh, I would like to thank Misha one more time. Uh, if you wish, uh, you can uh, go to the bottom of your uh, screen and there is a reactions button. Uh, I certainly have a strong reaction. Uh, again, Misha, thank you very, very much for this. I will uh, like to conclude uh, by reminding you of uh, the upcoming seminar. Uh, it is coming on this coming Thursday at 11 o'clock. Uh, again, there is a Zoom link in the emails you would have received, or you can go to the webpage on the MIT Nano website to find more about it. It's uh, titled Nanoscale Insights into the Mechanism of Cellular Growth and Proliferation by uh, Katsper Rogala um, from Whitehead Institute um, who's joining us for this. Uh, so I look forward to seeing you uh, in a couple of days. Thank you for being here today. Take care. Yeah, thank you very much.